This is Katrin with Disability Rights New York. Welcome to our podcast, Empire State of Rights, where we bring you information on the most relevant topics regarding disability rights and advocacy. Today, we welcome the founder of Equal Opportunities for Students, Elijah Armstrong. He's here to discuss the Human Armstrong Educational Awards and advocacy for equal access in education. Elijah, thank you so much for joining us today. Really glad to be on the podcast with you. So before we start, I'm going to give my audio description. I am a white woman uh, in my late 40s. I have long brown wavy hair. Um, I am wearing a peach colored sweater with a, a gray t-shirt underneath it. And, um, and I think that's it for my description today. Elijah, can you provide us with a self-description and share a little bit with our audience about the work that you do? Cool. So uh, I am Elijah Armstrong. I am a lighter skinned black male with shorter locks in my uh, mid-20s. I'm currently wearing an orange uh, button-up polo shirt. Um, and I founded Equal Opportunities for Students, I uh, want to say about six or seven years ago now, actually. Um, and I run the Human Armstrong Award, a scholarship for students with disabilities. Um, we are in our third year of it currently. So yeah, that's the work that I do. What brought you to this type of work, um, especially around the education access for people with disabilities? And of course, then I want to follow up with how you started to work with Judy Human. But let's start with what brought you to this. Yeah, so I am epileptic. Uh, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, I went to Stanton College Preparatory School in Duval County, it's a public high school. Um, and my junior year, the lights in my math classroom flashed. They caused me to have seizures literally every other day. Um, it was bad. Like it was a second period class too. So I would go to school, I'd be in school for like two and a half hours, three hours, and have to go to the hospital. Um, so obviously that ruined my experience in that class and the, the back half of those classes that day and had implications on me the next day as well. Um, so I asked the school for an accommodation. Um, for a bit more context, Stanton was a really highly ranked high school. It was like third in the nation ranked by Newsweek at that point. Um, so I asked the school for an accommodation um, and they said they didn't do accommodations and that I would need to leave the school for the integrity of the program. Like they put that in writing. It was a really wild uh, circumstance. So I had to take legal action against the school um, and really fight for my right to be able to graduate with my peers and to be able to attend school um, with my peers. And it was a really um, hostile adversarial experience with um, just the surrounding community as well at that point. But um, yeah, especially because this was happening in like 2013, 2014. I, there's still a lot of problems with ableism, but the conversation around ableism in public is very different now than it than it was then. Um, and um, yeah, so I got to college. I graduated high school with my peers in 2015, um, got to college and immediately founded Equal Opportunities for Students to advocate for the rights of students with disabilities. Um, and just marginalize students in general to tell their stories and give them the chance to um, find out what their rights are, what resources they could access, um, things like that. So yeah, that's how I got into this ed work. So you started this while you were in college. Did you have any other experiences at the college that you attended that were also creating barriers for it, to your education? Or by that point, had you really you'd been through so much in high school, were you already aware of what you'd be on the lookout for? Yeah, I was I was really um, pretty aware of um, what to, to watch out for. That's not to say there were never any challenges, but that was one of the things that was really funny is people would say really sarcastically to me um, when I was in high school, they'd be like, well, what if this happens in college? What are you gonna do then? Like fully unaware of the fact that's literally what people with disabilities have to do like all the time, like literally exactly the same thing. Like if I want to get an education, that's what I have to do. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and the thing that I also think is really funny is a lot of people have, um, more challenges in higher ed than they do uh, in K-12 education, which, yeah, there's a lot that needs to be improved in the higher education system. But because of the fact that high school explicitly refused accommodations point blank period, I had like anything that I received 
on the higher ed level was significantly better than, you know what I mean? There was no point where I had to contact OCR or a lawyer. So like, it was a, it was a very different, uh, very different experience for me there uh, than it was then. That's not to say there weren't any challenges. And I know a lot of students who do have um, challenges in, in higher ed, but because of the situation I came from, it was not, uh, it was a much easier experience for me at that point. So it sounds like the experiences uh, as, uh, I want to say unfortunate, but really as difficult as they were in high school prepared you for what you would be on the lookout for in college. And you made a statement that there are differences, right, between K through 12 and then going into higher ed. Um, and let's talk about some of those barriers in education that really are commonly observed in our system today. I, I find it interesting and um, and something that I'd like to learn more about really is the is also the peer to peer um, relationship as these things are going on. You, you you talked a little bit about the feedback that you got from your peers. Um, how does that also how does that impact uh, the barrier to education as well as really you're having a full experience of whether it's high school or college? If you could talk a little bit about those things. Yeah, one of the things I think a lot of people don't really recognize, um, well, they recognize, but not really in terms of disability, is the fact that specifically when you're looking at college, it's true for high school as well, but when you're looking at college and higher ed, that it is much more than just the academic experience that oftentimes you're living on campus, you're going, you know, you're joining clubs, you're going to recreational activities, whether it's bars or clubs or wherever it is you're going, you're going places with your friends. Um, and if those places are inaccessible, you're not able to get the full experience. Like I talk to students all the time who have challenges with housing being being inaccessible. So they can't live, you know, where their peers live. And, you know, living with your friends is a is a large part of this experience. You know, clubs meeting in areas that are that are inaccessible. Um over the summer, there was a a I meet with the AAPD interns every year because I live in DC now, but there was an issue with one of the bars that one of the some of the interns want to go to not being wheelchair accessible. And it was a thing that kind of blew up over Twitter. But it's like those are the kind of experiences that people have um, pretty regularly. And I think that that's something that people need to be very conscious of is making sure that the entire experience is accessible so that people can experience all that their peers are because i i know that you know you don't just go to school just to obviously the classes are very important but you also build relationships and network and you also get extracurricular activities and you get to grow in other ways as well um so making sure those things are also accessible for people is very important Right. And certainly all of those experiences are adding to your growth really as a human. You know, you're you're going to experience these types of relationship developments and networking as you move through your career. And um, so not having access to those, uh, it's and it, and it's really shocking to me that here we are in 2023. And when there's an issue of accessibility, especially like you're saying to a bar that isn't accessible to a person who uses a wheelchair. Oftentimes the response is, well, we really don't have a lot of people who use wheelchairs that that come here. And it is it is really shocking that still there isn't that um, that they can't draw that line. Well, no, of course, uh, they're not able they're not coming here because they're not able to get in. What has your been experience in how the public is addressing these issues and even talking to our audience? What are some ways that we can advocate for equal access in our everyday lives, um, even outside of education. Yeah, I just want to speak on that part a little more about the, you know, people with disabilities not coming because the place isn't accessible. So when I was in high school, actually, um, the experience that I had was so um, sort of extreme that it ended up uh, in the local newspaper. And I caught uh, I caught a lot of flack from um, some people who worked at the at the district and also from like some surrounding parents and a lot of students. It was like a really wild circumstance. But also it wasn't just that backlash. I also heard from a lot of other people that would come up to me and my mom and be like, oh, my God, I'm having this experience. I take this medication. and It affects me this way. I have this issue and it affects me this way. But I can see the way people are treating you. And that is exactly why I'm not 
going to come forward and say anything. So it really is a self-fulfilling prophecy um, in that way. Um, yeah, just generally being, my answer to this would be generally being aware of um, disability and listening to disabled voices, I think is a really important thing is to ensure that especially because so often the voices of disabled people are not really centered to make sure that it's still a disability centric movement um, and to uplift um, those voices and trust that people know um, what their access needs are, are, um, are very important steps to take. Well, and one thing that I feel like we've said in the past several uh, recordings that we've done here, and we say it all the time, uh, dear and why, that if you meet one person with a disability, you've met one person, right? Like um, an accommodation is going to be as individual as the person that you are talking with. And um, and knowing how difficult it can be to even ask for the accommodation, I think is um, is one of the barriers in and of itself, as, as you spoke about, where some people won't even go there because it's too much. And um, and so the work that you're doing really is giving other people the space to start that accommodation process and feel supported through it. Um, and so I thank you so much for for that work. And and really in the same stream, you know, we've been talking a lot about ableism and linguistic ableism and how even in movements, um, as you said, when when the voices of uh, disabled people are um, not being heard or considered, even within the movement, it, it changes things. And and we're looking at language, right? Words matter. Um, and so as we look at some of the words that are still being used now, whether it's special needs or special education, differently abled and handy capable. And everyone in the audience, I, I want to let you know that uh, we're referring to these words to uh, identify ableism and words that really are outdated and quite honestly um, can be very offensive to people. So Let's talk a little bit about these terms and why the othering of any specific community uh, is is really at the root of a lot of, I think, misunderstanding, as well as um, is making it a barrier in and of itself. Let's let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, one of the things I think is most interesting, and it's a through line that you hear in a lot of people's stories, like one that you hear in Judy's, is that education and not just as a student but like in the working in education is oftentimes very inaccessible to people with disabilities so you find a lot of people even when they're very well meaning um that are separated from the actual disability community and the people who it is that we are talking about um so oftentimes you'll see um things discussed with sort of a charity model and and these um phrases that we don't typically, that we as disabled people don't typically use for ourselves. Um, but I, it's really reflective of the fact that you don't see a lot of disabled people working um, in education because it's so often inaccessible, which is also part of the challenge is the fact that, you know, inaccessibility for um, students is oftentimes also an accessibility for teachers or for administrators. Um, yeah, and I think that that's something that education in general should work at achieving more in the future is being more accessible for teachers, for administrators, for professionals with disabilities. Because I think also there's that mentorship aspect to be able to see uh, and hear from and get advice specifically from people who experience things that are similar to the things that you experience. I think it's something that's like important and sort of how this problem manifests. I think it's vital, right? I mean, uh, as as children, as uh, teenagers and adults, and even people who decide they're going to have a, a different life, um, even at my age, right, where they say, you know, 
if you're looking at the way to your future, you want to also be able to see it in front of you, which means we need to see people who are like us doing the things that we want to do, even in order to know that it's a possibility to start the journey. And so to your point, if if we aren't uh, able to see teachers who either have a, a disability that is apparent or one that they can, can even speak about, um, we may not have the ability to have uh, the students that are in their care to be able to see that and to know that anything is possible if they want to do the same thing. Um, and of course, you brought up Judy Human, and um, let's talk. I, I don't even want to say let's talk a little bit about her. I want to talk a lot about her. Um, you know, Judy is a renowned figure in the disability rights movement and often referred to as the mother of the disability movement. Um, and her death was uh, sudden. And um, so let's talk about uh, the disability movement, really starting with Judy and how her influence really is impacting all of the things that we've talked about so far. I mean, Judy did everything. Like Judy, Judy did everything. Uh, and Judy knew everyone um yeah it's just so remarkable i i first met judy in 2018 and this is something that i think is really remarkable um i'm not sure how familiar the listeners are with the aapd internship program but aapd the american association for people with disabilities runs a internship program every summer um, and they match you with a mentor i was an intern in 2018 and my friend maria her mentor was judy human um, so, which is so wild to think about, you know, and I, it's just so wild to think about at this point, this was in 2018. So Judy had already been Senate confirmed twice. She was working for the Ford foundation and she signed up to be like an official mentor for this program. And she kept up with Maria too. Like I went out to dinner, uh, and drinks with, uh, Maria and like a whole group of people that, that she kept up with, uh, from that from that period of time is Judy was really, really into um, like five years later, she's still, you know, staying in contact with these people. Uh, she was really, really into mentoring people. Um, yeah. Judy did so, so much. I don't even know uh, where to begin, but that was just something that I wanted to name was how much she gave to to other people in that way. Right. And we can talk a little bit about the things that she did do. And we'll certainly put them in the notes of the, of the podcast as well, um, because we are talking about legislation, uh, Section 504, the Individuals uh, with uh, the Individuals with Education Act, the Rehabilitation Act, the UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the, of course, the Americans with Disability Act, the ADA. And so when you ended up meeting her, I mean, I, I just find it not surprising, but absolutely fascinating that she was still keeping up with her students five years later. And I mean, what a what an illustration of her commitment, not just her commitment to the students, but her developing relationships and keeping them when really she had an awful lot going on. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Yeah, no, she she really did. Uh, she really did. Uh, the work that that I started with Judy when, so I met her in 2018, but uh, I won the the Paul G. Hearn Emerging Leader Award in 2021. And that's how we ended up starting the Human Armstrong Award. I initially wanted to name it the Human Award, but Judy was insistent we name it the Human Armstrong Award to like work as co-equal partners on this, um, which also again, really shows the kind of um, work and energy and, and thought process that she had in this. Um, and she was really, even though at that point, Crip Camp had already come out um, like, being human had already come out. She was like really a very large, pretty mainstream famous person um, at that point. Uh, but she was very, very dedicated to this project. Um, and she read through the applications, like she had very strong opinions in terms of, you know, what we were looking for and what the process should look like and really enjoyed meeting with the students as well once they were selected. Judy did. Um, a lot and it's again when you're looking at the fact that she was doing so many things at this point the fact that she took this on so so heavily was uh really appreciated and also really remarkable but yeah no judy really really cared um about giving her time to the youth and making sure that the disability movement continued and has 
more people continually pouring into it. Um, so as we talk about the eligibility for this award, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the there's sixth graders, right? So it's, it's like 10 or 11 years old. And I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, a 10 or 11 years old being able to put together an application, but also the possibility previous till now to meeting Judy through that. I um, I think it's such a pivotal time in a child's life. Was that intentional? Was the sixth grade year something you really thought about? And, and talk to us a little bit through that process. Yeah, yeah. Um, because of the fact that when you specifically when you look at Judy, the fact that her experience with ableism in school started when she was in elementary school, actually started earlier than being eligible for the award. Um, and these are things that students experience very, very often. Um, and the only reason uh, initially when we want to start it, we want to do it through elementary school, but we realized that we would have some challenges in terms of, because ultimately what we do is once we have the winners, we shoot videos with them. Um, we shoot video interviews with them telling their stories and then they're illustrated by a group of artists. And those videos actually travel really well, actually. Um, Sometime in the next couple of months, I'm going to be um, speaking at a class at the Harvard Grad School of Ed. Um, I know they've been used in some other universities as well. Um, it, it gives them the chance to hear actually from students with disabilities. Um, and we realized uh, just having a conversation with some people that disability aside, um, that sort of ability to weave your life narrative is something that's kind of hard when you're that young so we decided to just move it up to um middle school but in the course of the time that we've run the award we've only run it for two years so far and we've already had two middle school students win uh one was hamani who was shooting youtube videos uh, she's an aac user she was shooting youtube videos um to teach her class and her classmates and her teachers about what it was like to use um aac which was really cool to see someone advocating in that way. And the other was one who just won this last year, which was Ava. Um, and Ava did a lot of work around realizing that her school was inaccessible and contacting uh, the superintendent and making sure that the superintendent understood that things that a lot of people don't think about, like that sinks weren't at a height where students that were in a wheelchair could use them, that uh, the playground was inaccessible and that the playground should be accessible too to students who use wheelchairs. And it's like, we we really do see students at a really young age doing things that are really remarkable, but also without the award, those are sort of things that aren't really acknowledged, you know, is there isn't really a space. And that's something that part of the reason why I want to create this award as well, was the realization that uh, a lot of people do a lot of really impressive work in the realm of disability that doesn't really have anywhere to go on a resume where you can't really explain, hey, I've done this, hey, I've done that. But no, the we we really do see a lot of really impressive students that are very young doing doing a lot of work. We get some great high school students too, and obviously students in higher ed as well. But we really do see some really great things from students in uh, middle school and higher ed. That's fantastic. And you spoke about the first uh, award winner. And for our audience who is not familiar with what AAC is, can you let us know what that is? I believe it stands for Augmented Alternative Communication. Uh, I might have gotten that mixed up, but um, it's essentially a machine that allows you to uh, text to speech where you can you can type into the machine and the machine will then convey spoken language. Um, and it's an alternative form of communication that allows a lot of people with various disabilities. I know oftentimes uh, people have um, autism or apraxia um, and use a device like this, but it's, um, yeah, that's the sort of work that, uh, well, other disabilities too, but those are just the ones that jump to mind because both of the people who use the AAC have those disabilities for the Human Armstrong Award. But yeah, that's what a AAC machine is. Thank you for that explanation. So let's let's do the whole pitch for our audience on um, who's eligible, how they can apply, and of course we'll put all of this information in the notes and links that are relevant. But let's uh, let's give them all the info. Yeah. So Human Armstrong Awards scholarship for students in the sixth grade and up, including all forms of higher education. Uh, and we're looking for students who have experienced and fought against ableism in education. Um, the application is pretty simple. It's open until July 16th. Um, 
Yeah, it's a pretty simple. If you don't uh, want to fill out the Google form, you can also just answer the questions in a video and then email it to us uh, because we like to have alternative forms of media, um, you know, just to make it as accessible as possible. And you get to have a lot of really cool opportunities um, from being selected as a winner. Thus, we select six winners every year. Each winner gets a thousand dollar monetary award. And then we do the interviews that are illustrated by Access Gallery, which is a group of disabled artists out of Colorado. Um, and then we also get to introduce them to a lot of really cool leaders in the disability community. So uh, the Honorable Tony Quello and Kat Perez uh, from the Quello Center, uh, Maria Town, the president of AAPD, uh, Colleen Starkloff, who is the executive director of the Starkloff Institute, um, Arlene Mayerson from the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, Marcy Roth from the World Institute on Disability, and uh, Jim Lebrecht from Crip Camp. So we've gotten a lot of really cool people who worked with Judy from all different, you know, aspects of her life from, you know, from all the way from Camp Jeanette through Dreadith, through, you know, the passage of the ADA to, um, you know, all of the work that she was doing with uh, with AAPD. Um, and then also uh, Emily Ladau um, is going to be doing a session with our winners before the video interviews start just um, because, you know, Emily Ladau was the first editor in chief of Rooted in Rights. So to sort of teach them how to uh, how to tell their stories, which is, uh, you know, can't really think of anyone better to do that, you know, to, to teach you how to advocate as a disabled person. So, yeah, we've gotten some um, really great people together. Um, yeah. And it's a really cool opportunity. And we also select 10 semifinalists who each receive a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. Um, and also, we usually get some surprises in there, some other things that we get. Like last year, um, they were still, uh, the Department of Education was still looking for comments on ways to update the 504 guidelines. So um, our winners were able to meet with the Department of Education to give their opinions on how Section 504 should be updated. Um, so that's the kind of work that that we're doing and the kind of things that these winners get to experience. Um, and I'm really glad we get to continue this because Judy was really excited um, every year about meeting these people and helping make sure that you know, the disability community gets to continue and, and keep growing. Absolutely. What an extraordinary uh, list of people that you have working on this team and what an extraordinary opportunity for your applicants. I mean, really getting connected um, through this type of program. And let me ask you, so if it's starting at sixth grade, going through 12, is that all? Oh, not that 12, through all forms of higher ed. Oh, so okay. we get like law school students, PhD students. Uh, we had two master's students who won last year. Yeah. So if you are in school and above the sixth grade, you are eligible. And can you apply every year? Yeah, we've had students who have applied. Uh, we've had students who have applied the first year who weren't able to get it, who were able to get it the second year because we usually get like a, a large number of applicants. Um, so again, if you don't get it, don't feel bad. It's a it's right. a really it's a really difficult process. But, um, yeah, no, you're allowed to apply more than once. It sounds like it's pretty competitive. So I, I was thinking, wow, there's uh, have, being able to apply year after year as you're in school is is a great way also to really build your profile and build your portfolio when it comes to these types of applications. Um, and so if our audience wants to learn more about the Human Armstrong Foundation uh, or Education Awards, where should they go and who should they contact if they have questions? Um, well, we run it, we run it, we're partnered with the Quello Center. Uh, so you can go to either my website, which is equalopportunitiesforstudents.org or the Quello Center's website, reach out to uh, myself or the Quello Center, and we'd be really glad to answer um, any of the questions that you have about the project or the award or eligibility. Um, and yeah, we're, we're really excited to be seeing uh, all of these applicants. I can't wait to see uh well, first of all, who the winner is, um, and also to see the other videos that you have. Are those from previous applicants or are those from the winners that you had from the last two years? Yeah, they're all from the winners from the last two years. So we have, for our last cycle, obviously, we got kind of thrown off because uh, of the passage of Judy. There was a, a lot of, uh, you know, work that went in there. And then obviously, we we're all very close to Judy. So it was a very difficult time for us personally as well. But um, we have 10 videos up right now, the six winners from last year, four of the winners from uh, this most recent year. So we have two more videos that are in the process of being finished. 
And then by the end of this cycle, we'll have a total of 18 videos because each one of our six winners gets uh, gets their video done. So yeah, if you're curious to see what kind of work the students were doing over the last two years, um, it's on our YouTube channel. The videos are also on the Equal Opportunities for Students website. So you can see what 10 of the winners have done, um, what 10 of the winners have, have done um, um, to that point. And don't ever think that you haven't done enough because there are a lot of people who I've talked to because, uh, you know, we like to meet and, and talk to uh, the winners afterwards. There are a few of them who thought, oh, I didn't think that I'd done enough. So just if in doubt, just apply and there's there's no harm in giving it a shot. Great advice. And I feel like we could probably talk about all of this work for hours. Um, and I and I really would love for you to um, let us know if there's anything else that you'd like to share uh, with our audience today, if there are any other projects or future developments coming up um, that you'd like to let us know about. Uh, we can talk about that before we sign off today. Um, not really that I can think of. It's just, uh, you know, it's a really, really busy time. <laughs> with, um, you know, everything going on. I'm actually uh, flying to New York. Uh, it will have happened by the time this airs, but I'm actually flying to New York uh, Monday night because Tuesday the Ford Foundation is holding a, a memorial for Judy. Um, yeah, that I'm going to be speaking at. Um, and then that Friday, I'm presenting to the AAPD intern class about, you know, self-advocacy and all the work we did with Judy. So yeah, it's just a really busy time, uh, but it's great to see um, Judy being remembered in the work that she did. Um, being so deeply acknowledged. But yeah, that's just what I would say is um, the project out. I'm I'm really glad with the team we've been able to put together. Um, and I'm really glad for the opportunities we're going to be able to give um, our, our incoming cohort of Human Armstrong Award winners. Well, we are so excited to see the developments and what an unbelievable way also just to um, keep Judy's legacy alive. Uh, for, for really for the future of all, um, all of your applicants. And we just look forward to seeing everything that they're going to do and everything that this uh, project is going to do. So thank you so much for taking time during this very busy time for you. Um, and we look forward to talking to you again. Hopefully we can have you on when we have the winner. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. All right, great. Thank you for your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Empire State of Rights has been brought to you by Disability Rights New York, your source for disability rights and advocacy. If you enjoyed our program, make sure to subscribe, like, and share this post. The video for this episode is available on our YouTube channel with closed captioning and ASL interpretation. If there is a subject you would like us to discuss, please email podcast at drny.org or comment below. For more Empire State of Rights, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube.